So this is me now. Uh, so I work with Kevin at headquarter uh, supporting uh, some of his uh, uh, AI uh, strategies and, uh, and implementation. Um, I'm actually based uh, at Marshall and I work with Rahul uh, with his impact team as well. Uh, so this workshop is focused around training data sets, uh, like we heard. And what I am excited about is that there's a lot of interest and in, uh, a, a need uh, for dealing with the requirements for creating these massively uh, uh, large data sets, training data sets, right? Uh, and, and to have the experts in the field who actually practice uh, machine learning uh, in earth science is, is a very exciting thing for me. So I want to start out with uh, uh, an animation that uh, Rahul's team did in terms of looking at uh, keywords uh, on, on published papers in, in, in AGU journals and where, uh, what, what uh, we can glean from that. So this is a decade long uh, uh, study on the papers, but just looking at the keywords. As you see, climate change dominates uh, uh, most of the decade, right? And if you look at 2018, suddenly machine learning pops up. So going from science, scientific study, it went into uh, technique, right? Uh, in terms of keywords. So that tells us where things are going, going forward. They also did a, a little bit of deeper dive on, on looking at papers uh, across uh, multiple uh, journals. So if you look at, uh, AMS, for example, the red one, uh, it has increased about 10%, uh, I believe, 40%, 40% over, over the decade. If you look at AGU, which encompasses the entire earth science, um, that has uh, almost doubled, right? Uh, same thing with uh, IEEE and SPIE. If you look at uh, across domain, um, you can see um, the biogeosciences has probably the most number of in terms of percentage, uh, followed by land surface studies, right? Uh, if you look uh, even deeper by looking at uh, types of data they use, uh, which is related to training data set, right? Which can tell us more about training data set. You can see a lot of uh, uh, research being done, machine learning research being done with in situ and model data. So what does that mean? Uh, so NASA has a lot of uh, airborne and satellite data, right? So there's an opportunity there for us to exploit that data to further uh, machine learning. So to advance the machine learning for our science, uh, uh, there are four major things uh, that needs to happen, right? Open science, Community building, because it's a cross-domain uh, study. Um, you need to have benchmark data sets so that people can generate new models and compare uh, using a common framework. And you also have to uh, have uh, new look at, uh, people looking at new models and architectures. What does that really mean? Open science means open data, open source, right? In, a, in, in current context, also means open, open publication. Community building includes team science. It has to be uh, uh, a collaboration between domain science experts and, and machine learning experts. And conference like this and workshops like this and is also part of that community building process. Benchmark data sets, um, we need an imaginate for uh, our science, right? There has been effort like SpaceNet, uh, but we need to scale that uh, so that um, broader community can, uh, can use that data and compare their models against. In terms of uh, new models, uh, uh, we, uh, there's a lot of push towards a physics-based model and, and interpretability of those models. And, and that will also help advance uh, that science. So we did have a, a, a workshop early 2018. It was related to uh, cloud analytics, right? Uh, but a lot of analysis in the cloud also related to machine learning. So there were machine learning experts who uh, were doing uh, uh, machine learning in the cloud. And part of that uh, report uh, included certain uh, these recommendations. So they, at that time, they, uh, they wanted uh, the data systems to um, 
a focus on evaluating new strategies to create labor training data sets for our science. We also wanted a, system, a systematic process to create, distribute, archive these training data sets, right? And, and these are some of the things that we're addressing in this workshop, you know, in the focus group. Uh, Community-wide benchmark data sets, another key things that, uh, that I showed earlier, right, in terms of bigger picture. Um, and uh, some specific things like uh, NASA has this field camping data, institute data, and also satellite data, right? Sometimes those data on the, on the uh, uh, institute side and, and, uh, and, and uh, ground observation are more reliable uh, with high fidelity, right? Those can provide uh, some truth data sets that, that uh, and they coincide with, when you can combine that with uh, satellite uh, remote sensing data. But all in all, the conclusion here is that biggest bottleneck in adoption of machine learning earth science is the training data, the availability of training data set, right? So if you look at all these great advances in, uh, in machine learning for earth science, we can all trace it back to uh, having a good, reliable training data sets, right? But I think the progress in that sense is, getting, uh, is hitting a plateau because uh, all the low-hanging fruits have been already plucked, right? So models are getting more complex, right? The feature maps, the, the transformation functions uh, have lots of uh, dependent parameters that rely on uh, training data sets. And also a good generalization of these models uh, requires a, uh, at least in the tens of thousands of uh, uh, labor training data sets. But earth science data is not data poor, right? We have lots of data. We just don't have enough training data set up. Uh, label training data sets, which drives a lot of supervised learning. Uh, we don't have, I mean, we're not data poor because the, the NASA Advisory Council for Ad Hoc Big Data Task Force uh, did a study and came up with this conclusion that half of the, all the all, all science results are coming from archive data, right? So we can push that even further if we can create training data sets and, and serve that as, as part of our archive. Um, as you can see from the publications, that a lot of publications on the machine learning side, right? So this can go even further. So training data, we all know, we've seen this figure, right? Uh, models can be perfect, but if you have garbage data, you get garbage results. But training data sets always go hand in hand with model too, right? So you have perfect data, the garbage model, you still get garbage results. So these are the two things we're gonna focus on, I hope this, uh, workshop. So what do we already have as part of data systems? Uh, we have data, uh, about 34 petabytes was going to increase substantially in, in the coming years. Uh, we have very rich curated metadata, right, uh, that, uh, that helps us in discovering those data. We are going to the cloud, so we have a cloud infrastructure which can provide a turnkey solution for ML. Uh, and also, a lot of times these, uh, these machine learning uh, activities uh, end in, in, in publication of the paper. We need to take some of those uh, uh, high value uh, research and, and scale that to production and cloud certainly helps us do that. We also have uh, uh, enterprise-wide solution for, uh, for, uh, for our data, such as the Global Image Browse Service, which provides uh, tile-based services are very high resolution uh, and it's easily available for everybody to use. We also have Worldview, uh, which is a front end to, uh, to, to, to the Gibbs. We also have event database like Unet. Uh, we also have a cloud-based ingest archive and publication pipeline like Cumulus, right? Those all could be leveraged uh, uh, to extend uh, uh, machine learning activities. In terms of private industry partnership, we have a uh, uh, close partnership with the universities. Uh, we also have a close partnership with uh, companies like AWS and Google, who, which we, we have a Space Act agreement with. And all in all, we do all of this in open data and open source policy. Um, so these are the enabling factors that we can key on. So going back to the earlier diagram, so ESDS already does uh, number one, the open science, right? Community building, we're trying to do that. The workshop being one of the things that we're uh, uh, trying to accomplish that with. Uh, we 
We do have certain um, ML funded research activities and prototype activities that's looking at the number four. We certainly need to work on the benchmark data sets, which we don't have it yet. From the data systems perspective, the six focus area, there are six focus areas uh, currently. Um, obviously, operational infrastructure, we're looking at the cloud solutions. Uh, we are also uh, active in the community building uh, activities, uh, applications of ML, uh, tool development, focusing around our existing uh, infrastructure and, 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 uh, and services that we already have and obviously focusing on the training data development and the catalog of uh, uh, models and how to share the, those training data and models. So some of the AI initiatives we've taken uh, uh, include solicitations, such as advancing collaborative connections for access, Earth system science access. Um, these projects work very closely with the Earth Science Data and Information System project, uh, which actually manages the system behind the data that we have. Um, and one of these solutions currently uh, currently up uh, and due January 30th, I believe. Um, we have uh, this is the second round of ML-centered uh, solicitation in Access. Um, so there, uh, we're looking at in terms of funding these uh, activities that uh, we see a value in, in, in helping our science data systems program. We also have uh, uh, quite a few prototype activities uh, looking at applications of ML and processes, improving the processes of, uh, uh, of doing this ML, right? Uh, one of the projects, uh, the Interagency Implementation and Advanced Concepts Team uh, Impact at Marshall that Rahul leads uh, looks at a variety of aspects of uh, applications and, and processes involved in ML. Now, obviously, we uh, hold uh, workshops uh, as well. So here's an example of Access that was funded 2017. Um, so the researchers work very closely with the US DISC project. Um, this, here's a, uh, an example where uh, for doing a multi-temporal anomaly, anomaly detection uh, for SAR uh, as part of the uh, uh, process of ingesting the data, right. and this is actually helping them improve um, some of the manual, uh, manually uh, inspecting uh, for anomaly. So the product, I guess, in, in terms of scaling the labeling, scalable developing a labeling tool for training data sets. Uh, this is a prototype activity done by Impact Team to create a labeling tool that's that uh, exploits the existing services that's already there from the data system side. So we're not looking at just this traditional way of searching uh, the data set based on keywords, faceted uh, parameters, right? So this is a, a way of ML-driven uh, search and discovery uh, focusing on uh, earth science events, right? A lot of scientists start their career by looking at certain events uh, and study that events in detail, but there's not a, good way right now uh, to actually search for uh, data uh, that is related to certain events. So this allows you, allows them to uh, key, 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 uh, create a database of uh, uh, these earth science events and, and drill down to the data related to that. In terms of improving operations, we're looking at ML to uh, provide a consistent way of uh, doing a lot of uh, objective, obje objectively doing certain things. Uh, for example, look, assigning a science keywords to uh, certain data sets, right? If multi people, so the way it's being done uh, in the past is uh, looking at reading these uh, uh, abstracts and description about data sets and assign these keywords. So uh, different people can assign different keywords to the same uh, data sets if, uh, depending upon their background, right? So if you have a consistent way of a trained machine learning model to develop science keywords for these, then it will be consistent throughout the data systems. So with that, uh, what I think uh, uh, we should get out of this uh, workshop is, is first, uh, evaluation of current status of uh, training data sets and models uh, for our science study. Uh, maybe we can identify some gaps uh, for future study. Uh, the specific breakout group recommendations, that will be uh, helpful, and overall recommendations as well. 
and hopefully we can come up with some best practices on how to uh, process wise how how can we come up with a better process not uh, not focusing on the implementation part but uh, coming coming up with the uh, process that everybody can follow right? so going back to my first slide um, if uh, hopefully we can uh, execute on actionable recommendations uh, to address this my question of how to systematically feed complex data hungry uh, science standard models. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Manil. Uh, I feel like uh, you have covered almost 90% of my presentation. <laughs> so, but uh, I'm gonna start with a different perspective and that's from Sherlock Holmes. Uh, data, 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 he cried impatiently. I can't make bricks without the clay. Uh, that's from one of the uh, basically uh, Sherlock Holmes stories talking about making con uh, basically conclusive uh, statements about events and future things that data is really the essential uh, building block of that and we can easily map that to, to machine learning and in general data analytics that without data, without proper data, without uh, the right data, without accurate data, we cannot build a model. Manil just showed examples of that too. So that's where we come with uh, Radian ML Hub. And I wanna give you some examples of the uh, basically existing efforts in the community around that and why we started the uh, basically library called Radian ML Hub. Uh, you heard the word ImageNet. So ImageNet was one of the uh, very first uh, computer vision training data sets, uh, annotated images that has been uh, basically growing, not just as a data set, but as a community. So every year uh, there are competitions in the data, more groups and uh, communities are joining in, uh, adding to the labels, uh, contributing to that, uh, and basically competing and building models. And progressively the community has basically moved forward with better models, improvement accuracies, and they share the results uh, every year at the competition and a conference. Uh, so that can be like a good example of how can we implement such a uh, uh, benchmark in our community. But the harder problem is, this is just one uh, example, it's computer vision, it's just images. Uh, when you think about earth science, you have land surface processes, you have atmospheric science, you have oceanography, uh, you have a lot of other phenomena that needs its own basically benchmark. And it's not just uh, optical imagery that many of us are familiar with. Uh, some of the good examples of uh, uh, the training data in our community, which you will hear from all three, uh, they're all in this room now. Uh, the big earth net, uh, which is a basically uh, image classification problem from the group at TU Berlin. Uh, uh, it's around 600,000 labeled images with multiple land cover classes. Uh, all of them from Sentinel-2 and across uh, European countries basically. The geospatial coverage is EU. Uh, Chesapeake Bay land cover data, which is from the Chesapeake Bay Conservancy working with Microsoft AI for Earth program. Uh, and that is basically labels of land cover and building footprints from Microsoft Bing mapped on NAEP data and Landsat. All of them basically stacked in the same uh, grid resolution and a spatial temporal uh, resolution. And then the SpaceNet, the high resolution basically world view imagery with uh, roads and buildings uh, uh, image uh, boxes, uh, basically uh, object detection problem. And all of these are open source. All of them are available to people. Uh, they are basically different accesses to them. SpaceNet and Chesapeake Bay are now available in ML Hub. I will show later. We hope that we can also host Big EarthNet soon. Uh, but these show basically some of the good examples. And at the same time, the lack of diversity in the data. Uh, so these are the challenges we identify going into basically focusing on Radian ML Hub. Basically, the lack of geodiversity, as you just saw, uh, some of these are very much focused on the developed world. When you go outside of uh, the developed world, there is a significant lack of these data. Uh, scarcity of data sources. Many of these applications need ground reference data, uh, like agricultural applications. We have uh, a representative kind of representative sample of farming practices across the globe. And these are just um, from the basically geography and the optical perspective, but we know there are farming practices that are different. Fertilizer applications are different. Irrigation or uh, rain fed applications are different. There are a lot of uh, kind of uh, human impacts on that that makes it very diverse and we don't have that uh, basically uh, campaign or effort on the ground 
to collect more ground reference data to have the source for the label and then create the training data set. You will hear about some of those efforts in the, in the next presentations as well. Data accessibility, even if we create data, where are we putting them, how we are accessing them? Are they ML ready? Are they cloud friendly? Uh, are they open? Uh, these are all the challenges we have talked about. Interoperability, whether we are putting them in a specific repository that everybody needs to then adopt their tooling and their resources for that, or is it really uh, interoperable across different uh, platforms and uh, toolings? And then the machine learning readiness that I just talked about, that how much are the data, the training data, ready for the developer, for the user to ingest them to their modeling framework, or they need to do Reprojections, uh, I don't know, regreeding, a lot of other processes that again, it's a barrier for some of the uh, groups in the community. And these gaps basically result in many of the issues in the, in the machine learning modeling. Well, the main one is really bias and incorrect results. So you build a model, your training data is not representative. As a result, uh, your model is biased. And also inability to capture many of the wider possibilities. So if your data is even geographically diverse, but it doesn't capture the whole spectrum of events across the earth science, uh, then your model is not uh, good in predicting future events. Um, just briefly, this is a similar slide to what Mila showed. Uh, what happens currently in many cases is that, uh, for example, I assume group one is doing uh, training data generation, they build their model, they do their prediction and uh, basically benchmarking or KPI assessment. Group two comes and they do the similar thing, but they don't have access to group one's training data, so they have their own pipeline. Uh, you as a user at the end of the pipeline, you can benchmark those models or predictions against each other because they use different training data sets. Uh, and then they have different basically accuracy assessments and everything. A more ideal situation is we have a benchmark data that everybody can access, similar to the ImageNet, similar to Big EarthNet, similar to SpaceNet, then we can go after benchmarking models at the end of the pipeline. And then also agree on, oh, this is a good KPI for assessing, for example, image classification problems or uh, segmentation problems and so on. So this is where we are basically moving with Radian ML Hub and that's why we established what we call uh, an ML Commons for Earth Observation. Um, behind the scene is uh, an actual repository or you saw a lot of books here, a library uh, notation might be a good example. And there are a lot of books in there. Uh, we haven't uh, written all of the books. We are not gonna author all of the books, uh, but we are gonna keep a, a good library of all of those books. Uh, we have launched ML Hub publicly in December around the AGU uh, week. Uh, currently, we have uh, three crop type data sets uh, from uh, Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. We also have registered, as I just mentioned, partners data, the Chesapeake Bay land cover data and SpaceNet. And these data are not physically sitting on ML Hub repository. One of them is in Azure, one of them is on basically SpaceNet's bucket. But behind the scene, we have an interoperable catalog, the stack that you just heard and I will show you the infrastructure that everybody, all the users can come to one API, search the data and then access them and download them for their application. Uh, so making that again uh, a portal for discovery and access is really a key feature of the ML Hub. And future data sets coming up as a global land cover classification based on Sentinel-2, uh, it will come up in March, and then uh, surface water uh, based on Sentinel-1. Uh, you will hear about both of them. Rookie will also talk about the surface water later on. Um, and it's all open access. People can sign up uh, and start using the data. There is an authentication system just for the purpose of basically uh, monitoring access, but uh, everything is open and data licenses are all Creative Commons license. Uh, what is behind the scene? To get a little bit technical, not too much. Uh, it's really basically uh, data storages, these are the buckets of data which are sitting on different cloud resources. It doesn't need to be on our bucket. Uh, we are working with AWS. We have been fortunate to have their support, but uh, other data can be on any cloud repository. What is sitting behind our API is a standard data catalog, uh, which is based on a spatial temporal asset catalog or stack. Uh, and that enables this interoperability. It's a static catalog. It basically stores all the metadata information about your data set. And then we have basically the ML Hub API, which is a stack compliant API that users interact with that. So there's a public API endpoint. In future, we will have a Python client that people can access that. And also a search website for a more kind of user interface, web interface for access of that. And all of these is enabled because of a stack. Uh, uh, we didn't have a stack. That interoperability feature would be really hard. So, for that reason, we are not duplicating any data. We don't need to copy data to basically new storages. Uh, and 
data providers or data owners can put the data on their own repository if they want to manage that. That's really a key element of Radeon and Mojave in that sense. And before talking a little bit about the workshop, this is also the list of partners and collaborators that really helped uh, ML Hub to shape. Uh, they provided data, they provided uh, technical support or institutional support uh, that have helped us to get to this point and launch these uh, basically data sets. Uh, with that, I want to spend a couple of minutes on the, on the workshop, uh, both from a scope of the workshop that Manuel also talked about and uh, some of the logistics. So uh, you heard about the, the basically the expectations. Really, uh, the hope is to basically discuss the best practices for uh, how can we increase adoption of these machine learning technologies on Earth observation data, particularly NASA data, uh, and in particular the training data and model benchmarking issues that we talked and also evaluating what has happened so far, where are we now, uh, where can we go in future, what are the opportunities and what are the gaps, uh, and come up with a, so basically that would be the outcome of the workshop that Radian will synthesize out of the discussions, a guideline for uh, basically advances these applications. A guideline that will be used both by the users and also NASA in terms of guiding future uh, investments or uh, basically solicitations. And we would welcome all of you to engage in the conversations, particularly in the working group discussions, uh, share your feedback, uh, or if you have uh, basically seen advancements that you want to share, definitely go ahead and do that. We have reporters in each of the sessions. They will take notes and then we will compile all of those in a, in a uh, report at the end. Uh, we have three working groups, as you know. I will talk about the details in the afternoon, but at the high level, the first one focuses on uh, training data generation and errors and uncertainties with the, uh, basically those data catalogs. The second one workers, uh, working group focuses on modeling approaches and best practices for building models and benchmarking those. And the third one is on the part that is uh, sometimes uh, missed in many of the conversations. What is the best way for sharing and publishing ML applications and training data? Even if we do the first two working groups perfectly and we don't do the third one, we are still missing a big chunk there, right? We do things, if it's not reproducible, if we cannot share it in the right way, then the second group after you cannot uh, use them and reproduce them and advance them in future applications. Uh, I'd like also to thank the scientific committee who helped with the basic reframing of all the working group discussions and uh, putting the participants together. The, so all the names came through uh, the discussions the six of us have had during the last almost three months. So I appreciate uh, the work from all of them, Dalton, Linda, myself, Linda Nestes, uh, Manil Maskey from NASA, uh, Pierre Gentin, who couldn't be here from Columbia, but you will hear from him uh, with a remote presentation, and uh, Nana Yi from uh, DevSec. So thanks to all of you. And you might have seen this so far, but just in case, these are some of the logistics with Wi-Fi and the program and everything. All right, so uh, my name is Subit Chakrabarti, and uh, you know, welcome to the workshop. IEEE GRSS is uh, very proud uh, to be a you know part of this workshop, and uh, I'm going, not going to take up much of your time, but just going to introduce you to the Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society. So, a scientific society is essentially just you know a group of uh, researchers who come together to form a community, uh, and uh, GRSS itself uh, has been you know a part of IEEE for 30 years, 40 years. Um, uh, the key part of the society, parts of the society are publications, conferences, uh, technical activities. We also organize prof uh, professional activities and information services. Uh, I think the, the most important thing to remember about GRSS is that it is pretty global. So we have 75 plus chapters worldwide, including one in Washington, DC, uh, lots of chapters in the East Coast. Uh, and we also empower our members to form a chapter if they want to. So if you have 12 professional members of GRSS anywhere in the world, you can form a chapter. Um, we publish a lot of journals that you might have published in. If you haven't, you should. Um, the transactions in geoscience and remote sensing, uh, the JSTARS and remote sensing magazines and letters. Uh, so JSTARS is open access since January. So that's, that's the one journal that I'll really recommend you publish. And I'll talk about uh, a call later that might be very interest, interesting. It says soon to be open access, but I assure you it's already open access. Um, we also support community developed uh, tools for uh, things like data and standard uh, algorithm evaluation. So we have the DAS website. 
and the RFI observation display system, which is, you know, came from a publication. So if you do want to, uh, you know, transition your publication from something that academics read to a tool that can be used, uh, we also empower that as a society. Uh, we, organize, we organize contests like the 2020 GRSS Data Fusion Contest. So I was talking about this uh, to someone who didn't know that this exists, and this is right up their alley. So uh, this contest this year, what we're uh, looking for is uh, land cover classification. There's two tracks. One is land cover classification using high resolution labels, and one is land cover classification using low resolution labels. And it uses the SEN12MS data set that some of you might be familiar with. Uh, it's a data set of Sentinel-1 and 2 observations uh, in Europe with you know, labels. So essentially what happens is that you submit an algorithm and you're given a data set with labels and a data set without labels. And based on the accuracy and the data set without labels, you be, decide who comes first, second, and third and they're invited to present a paper at our annual conference. And you, you get other stuff, which is you know, not just invited. Uh, so we also sponsor other events. So we are sponsoring a workshop that uh, is actually really good. So uh, the Earth Vision Workshop, we do it every year. Uh, we have funding to do it this year and we have perpetual funding for it. So we're gonna keep doing this workshop every year. It's, it's at the Computer Vision and Pattern Recognition Conference. Uh, it's in Seattle this year. Uh, the last day to submit a paper for that workshop is March 31st. So please, please do it. Uh, the, the SpaceNet 6 challenge is also a part of that workshop, which I'll talk about later. Uh, we also support uh, you know, analysis ready data and other things like the Deep Globe Challenge at CEPR. We hold the, our annual conference, which is the I, IEEE International Geoscience and Remote Sensing Symposium. It was in Japan last year, so that's where all the pictures are from. The first picture on the left is actually the emperor of Japan, who apparently is a hydrologist, and he showed up at the conference without telling anyone, and you know, spoke, and he, he's actually a great person. So we usually have more than 2,500 people over you know, 230 to 250 sessions. This year it's in Hawaii, uh, the paper submission deadline was last night at midnight. So <laughs> if you didn't submit a paper, you missed. But next year it's in Belgium, so please come to that. We also have a, a panel of lecturers. So we have people from academia and industry. So how this works it, is if you have a chapter, uh, you can ask for any of these people to come and speak to you at your chapter, and GRSS covers the cost for their transport and accommodation. Um, there are a lot, lot of other people. Uh, so Keely Roth from Climate Corporation made this slide and she didn't put herself on it, but you know, she's also there. We also uh, develop courses for remote sensing education. So these courses, all free to members. Uh, we have webinars by uh, you know, really interesting people every month, also free to members. We facilitate and connect. So we have and the idea committee, which makes sure that all parts of the globe uh, are represented. Uh, so what can we do for your community? We can keep, you know, support your ed education of your staff. We can promote your capabilities. We can find you young and motivated people with, you know, events. So if you're recruiting, uh, a lot of big companies have sponsored our events. And what we do is we give them a chance to, uh, you know, recruit people who attend. And uh, everyone has, you know, raved about those opportunities. Uh, and then we have an e-newsletter, a magazine on our website. Uh, so please join our community. Uh, you'll meet a lot of interesting, fun people and uh, you know, really, really help our community. So uh, one way to do that is to come to IGARS in Hawaii. Uh, it's, it's, in, it's in the Big Island. It's on a lovely beach, uh, but I promise it's not just all about fun. There's actually a lot of good sessions. Uh, so the, the special issue for JSTARS that I was talking about is on analysis ready data. And uh, so the submission system is open until March 31st and it's gonna be published later this year. So once JSTARS, now that JSTARS is open access, the turnaround time has decreased a lot. So we uh, strive to publish papers within about four months of them being accepted. 
Uh, so to end, I'm gonna talk briefly about SpaceNet. So Joe and Daniel are gonna speak about it more. Uh, so SpaceNet uh, really came about as a convergence of two trends that you know Manil talked about and Hamid talked about, which is this like really deep emphasis on AI and computer vision, and uh, the belief that uh, increased overhead co data collection will fundamentally disrupt uh, geospatial ana analytics. So we need it, but there's like limited adoption. So after the after Hurricane Maria, it took 70 plus days and a lot of volunteers uh, to map Puerto Rico. And it doesn't need to be that way. Uh, th there are a lot of challenges, uh, you know, most of which are talked about and well known to the audience of this workshop. You know, lack of labeled data sets, a uh, few baseline models, and not a lot of ways to put algorithms into production. So the mission of SpaceNet uh, is to accelerate open source AI applied research uh, for geospatial applications with a foundational interest in mapping. And uh, these are the partners that we have right now. Uh, you know, a lot of people in this room belong to one of these organizations. Uh, so the four pillars are, you know, label data sets, sets, competitions, open algorithms, and open evaluation. Uh, most of these are, you know, really what we've come to this workshop for. So I look forward to discussing this all with you over the next two, three days. Uh, there's SpaceNet has, has challenges. So uh, some of you might be uh, familiar with these. We have a new one, which is the sixth challenge, which is part of uh, the CVPR workshop this year, the IEEE CVPR workshop this year. And that challenge is, 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 is building de de detection from SAR imagery. And the SAR imagery is, pro is provided by Capella Space. So this year we have uh, you know, private SAR imagery, which is going to be very exciting. And if you have any questions about GRSS, uh, please ask me. If you have any questions about SpaceNet, ask Daniel and Joe, they know more than me, but you can also ask me and I'll probably point you to them. All right, thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, thank you. Um, so the work I'm talking about today represents the efforts of a lot of institutions and people over several years. Um, hmm. I'll get to advancing the slide here eventually. What am I missing here? All right. Uh, also support uh, primarily from a Midyar Networks uh, property rights initiative, which is now just recently placed fund, but also NASA, um, Amazon Web Services, um, Xavier with engineering support. So a bunch of you are in this room, so thank you. Um, and also I'd like to, of course, acknowledge there's a lot of hard work that's gone into the methodology and developing the software by a number of current and former graduate students. Uh, I wouldn't be standing here without them. I'd have nothing to show you. Um, and also, I'd really like to highlight our mapping team. Or they're a special collective. They're based in Nairobi, and they do the hard work of, of creating the labels that train and validate our um, mapping approach. And this is really key, and I'd like to, I uh, hope to convince you towards the end of this why that is. Um, so what we're trying to do in this project is really answer two questions. Uh, basically where and how much cropland there is now in, uh, in Africa, and then how many fields are there and how big, how big are they? So what are the characteristics of those croplands? Um, those are two pretty important questions to answer now because the region is starting to undergo really big agricultural transformation. And if you want to understand where that transformation is going, what its impacts are, et cetera, you really need to answer those questions. Right? The unfortunate problem is, is that to answer those two questions, or even the first one, you really rely on remote sensing to do it. And it's a very difficult problem to solve with remote sensing um, because the characteristics of these croplands, which are primarily smallholder dominated, really challenge, they introduce a lot of error into remote mapping algorithms. There's, fields are small, they move a lot, uh, they blend in with the background vegetation. These things all introduce error. So it's a really difficult question to answer. It gets even harder if you want to answer that because you need to start going to segmentation approaches. And so on top of the sort of conventional problems you think about with uh, error in, in sort of classification algorithms and you know, related to imagery, there's also, I'd say, particular problems related to how you train and validate uh, mapping approaches for this. It's a really, it's a big problem, um, particularly if you wanna to get to segmentation because then you need to start looking at um, something that tells you what the average field sizes are like. So you need boundary maps. Collecting boundary maps from the ground are actually quite difficult 
let alone the logistic expense is really big of getting out to the fields and mapping things, <laughs> but you also don't necessarily get, I would argue, a, an answer that's much better than what you get from looking at an image. And the reason that is, is because uh, you've got to ask people where their field boundaries are, and different farmers might have actually different interpretations of what a field actually is. So you might ask one, so here's a field here in, in, in Ghana. One farmer might tell you, well, it's this active part, which I would, uh, I'm going to show you to map the boundaries of that, the yellow part. Another one might say, well, actually, I, I define my field as the fallow part plus the active part. So you might have inconsistent definitions even from the ground level. So maybe image interpretation is a better approach. A second major problem related to that is sort of a, a temporal mismatch one. Whether you're looking at an image interpretation approach to collecting your labels or getting it from the ground, um, you might have this problem where you get nice labels, you map the boundaries accurately, there's no problem about the definition, but if you're training on image, if you're classifying imagery with that label that's at collected at a later date, you might have a landscape shift. And this is pretty common. I've been staring at a lot of images over the past couple of years. This happens a lot. Um, there's a base map taken a few years ago, um, a Bing base map, and there is a planet scope image from 2018. You see the landscape is completely different. If those are your labels, you're encoding error in your algorithm. Um, and that's actually quite hard to control for. So uh, these are some particular problems related to training. And so what we've done is we've developed um, a mapping platform that tries to address some of the common uh, sources of error in mapping smallholder croplands, but also pays particular attention to the quality of the training and validation data. It has four components. This all lives on AWS. Uh, the first component is basically a process for taking a higher spatial and temporal resolution uh, imagery provided by PlanetScope and converting those into um, seasonal composites that are cloud free that represent a single agricultural year, we have the growing season, a growing season composite and the dry season immediately following that. This is important for two reasons. The high spatial resolution and the temporal contrast improve the classifier's performance, but the imagery is also high enough resolution that a person can look at it and make a reasonable <coughs> interpretation of what a crop field is. So you can label on the same images that you're classifying, which helps minimize that mismatch problem I was mentioning. This then gets fed into uh, our second and third components, which is a, a set of interacting components. The, 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 the primary component in this is a crowdsourcing platform that we've developed, uh, which has a lot of tools for uh, showing uh, web overlays using Xavier's raster foundry of the imagery, the composite imagery, a set of labeling tools, and then an accuracy assessment protocol for individual mapping workers that lies underneath the hood of that, where we track workers' accuracy. And so, we collect labels on this, on the same imagery that's being classified. Once we have enough, we pass that into a machine learning cluster. It's an ephemeral EMR cluster that runs the uh, Apache Sparks implementation of random forest. Uh, it then trains and makes a prediction on areas where we have no labels. It, it assesses the uncertainty of those areas with a simple uncertainty criterion and basically picks out the areas that have the highest uncertainty uh, in terms of the classification performance. Um, it then selects from those sites, sends it back to the workers for new labels, and then this pro that retrains with those new sets of labels added, this process iterates until you achieve a higher level of accuracy. And the important part is, since this is very training data intensive, it's also more efficient. So you get a more informative but somewhat smaller training data set than if you were doing a purely randomized approach to training data collection. Uh, that finally ends up with our fourth step, which is the segmentation that works on the original imagery, it combines with the probability image that comes out of the random forest, then we create a vector representation of fields. So that's our approach. And um, we're applying that approach to Ghana. So we're mapping all of Ghana with this. We've divided Ghana into 16 mapping regions. Each of these mapping regions gets its own uh, uh, training, uh, own machine learning process and uh, label collection process applied to it. Uh, and so we have 16 different models trained for Ghana including for the southwestern zone, which is mostly forest. And so you're mapping, uh, in this region, you're mapping arable croplands for the most part. Uh, uh, but down here, you're mapping basically clearings in what's pr predominantly tree crops and forest. Um, and so just to show you what our components look like in action. So this is uh, one mapping area of interest, which we tile up into a smaller set of tiles. And that becomes our target for compositing and creating prediction maps. We basically, for this, for the image composites, we capture every planet scope image that intersects that tile 
for the growing season between May and September. And we use a weighted mean uh, compositing process to create a cloud-free composite for the growing season. We do the same for four months in the following dry season. And that's what it looks like. Those then pass into our training and uh, our, our crowdsourcing platform, which really controls the whole machine learning process. Here's our mapping team looking at our interface here, which has a, a multiple renderings of both images, the growing season and the off-growing season. And they look at that and then they interpret what they see as a field of there. That's a, of course inherently a process, a process that can have a lot of error. You make digitizing errors along the boundaries, you make interpretation errors. So any one worker is gonna make mistakes. Some workers are better than others. To control for that, we have four workers map each site. So you can see there are four sets of polygons for this one location. Um, we then have a, an algorithm that has a, a Bayesian uh, process going on in it that takes each of those workers' labels and merges it into a consensus label, um, which tries to minimize the error. And it does that because we're assessing each worker's accuracy. We know each worker's um, sort of overall track record. And we can use that to weight uh, how much weight we apply to each set of labels in the merge. So we, we beat down error and we, and we start to filter out the least accurate results. Uh, I, this is, I won't go into the process, but this is, our, this is what the various components of our accuracy assessment thing is. Basically, we have reference sites that we slip in at about a rate of one in 10 to each worker's workflow. And we have five accuracy things that we score it against and it gives an average accuracy score. That's, our, that's how we track the accuracy and how we weight the um, merging of the labels. Our third component then looks like this. Uh, it's, a big, it's a big machine learning process that uses uh, some specialized tooling to convert the imagery uh, into, um, into, into features, extract features from it, and then pass it into the uh, Apache Spark uh, machine learning process. Uh, main thing is it's training on both the growing and the dry season imagery, but the thing I'd like to highlight here is the prediction maps. As I mentioned, it's iterative, so the first prediction this is the prediction you get from the first iteration for one tile. This is what you get from the fourth iteration. And what you can see is there's a lot more commission error and a lot less uh, sharp, sharpness along the boundaries of the fields there. It gets a lot crisper and sharper and less commission error when you get to the fourth iteration. So we're, we're using um, the algorithms telling us where it's struggling the most and it's sharpening itself that way as we go. Finally, here's a segmentation. We have a multi-step segmentation process that basically segments the entire image. Then um, it, 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 it combines with the posterior probabilities from random forest, and then it retains just those segments that have high cropland probabilities. So we get the cropland maps that way. Um, so um, one thing I'd like to point out here is then the value of having that uh, vector representation of, of, of croplands in this. So that helps us in this because we can constrain the segmentation to only fall within the minimum and maximum field sizes of what the workers are, what they're, what they're drawing. So we can, we can improve the accuracy of our segmentation to get closer to what the field sizes are probably like in each site. So just for some results, we finished uh, running all this at the end, of, in, in sort of the beginning of December. And what you see here are the distribution of points selected by the algorithm on each iteration. So it's color coded for iteration one, two, three, four, five. We have some validation sites that the workers also developed, 100 sites per AOI. That's what we're assessing our accuracy against on each iteration. And you can see the distribution of points that tells you in each of these zones where the algorithm was struggling the most. So you can start to see some interesting features. It's basically picking out in some areas, ecotones, the forest, savanna transition. That's why we have a lot of points clustered along there. That's what's causing problems. And then you see the gain in accuracy that you can get per uh, iteration. So you start, you see basically for most of these sites, you have a variable accuracy depending on which region you're talking about. But by and large, what you're seeing uh, on most dimensions, a little bit flatter on, on AUC, this measure of uh, performance, but it is increasing more sharply in accuracy for all those. So that's what we like to see. And then finally, results in the segmentation. I'm, I'm still, we're basically done, but I'm still printing out the results. But here's what you get. This is a segmented map for one of these areas of interest. I've got three mapped here. But what you get now is the ability you have to, to derive 
properties of the fields themselves within each of these mapping tiles. So what you have here is the proportion of coverage of polygons in each mapping tile here. So you can see where the cropland patterns are. Um, then you also get things like this, which is the average size of fields in each of those mapping tiles. And then what you can do, uh, there's all sorts of other things. You can get sort of standard deviation of field sizes. Uh, lots of different properties um, that you can derive that tell you something uh, about the agricultural management and, and its characteristics in there. And then finally, here we go with the uh, segmentation as well. So I, I, I have a nice segmentation process. It runs, but how valid are they? Are they actually close to what reality is? And so here again is why it's useful to have a, a nice labeling process where you can collect polygon representations of fields because we can use, from the validation sites, we can use those individual polygons, the distribution of those to see how well our segmentation actually matches those as a, as a measure of, of the truth. And so what we have here, for each of these three areas of interest, I, the red is the distribution of field size classes from the most accurate worker to map each validation site from 100 validation sites. That's the polygon distributions. And the blue is the polygon distributions from the underlying segmentations. And then you have some statistics. Uh, you have the mean and the median. And it's a little bit mean, shifted left according to the mode. So it's probably over segmenting a little bit, but the mean and the medians are pretty close to what the workers are seeing. So it's a nice validation for us. Uh, and it is constrained, mind you, but it's a nice validation that uh, we're getting, you know, reasonably close to what the fields look like, at least as a human interprets them looking at an image. All right, finally, um, this question, and since this is a, a, a workshop about training data, how much does the quality of your training data actually matter for your algorithm? Um, again, it's a nice to, we have all this label data because what we can do is we can take uh, labels from the least accurate worker to map each site in the training data, the most accurate worker to map each site, then our consensus labeling process and train up a random forest model from each of those and assess the accuracy of those. And we've done that for three different areas of interest. And we have two different accuracy uh, scores. And the main thing I just want to highlight here is that if you look at the, the least accurate labels, the accuracy of those and compare them to the other two approaches, the most accurate worker and our consensus labeling process, there's a big difference in the accuracy. So there's a big hit you take from your training label quality. And this is a way to actually account for that. So you can use that label quality to start to measure and account for how, how much your labels matter. Um, mind you, this is assessed against our consensus labels right now. We'll do this more robustly against a completely independent validation. But you can already see if you look at the posterior probabilities from these that you know, this is the map trained with the least accurate labels. You can see because it's, it's, it's the, the yellow and blue is less uh, pronounced there compared to these other two maps trained with the other approaches, that it's really a lot more of an uncertain prediction. And that's all down to label quality in this case. So it really does matter. And so I'll, uh, that's basically uh, my summary for you. Um, training data really, in the, at least in this mapping application, is really critical. It makes it, it's a big hit. It's one of the single most important things you can control to have a higher quality accuracy, and it also matters what imagery you're training on. I haven't quantified that, but training on a base map versus the imagery that you're processing, I would argue would have a similar hit uh, on, the, um, on the accuracy of your algorithm. Um, and so we end up with an ability to map croplands for a single agricultural year at really high resolution with a fairly rich data set, and we can update that annually now moving forward. And it's target for a lot of other mapping things, like if you want to build a yield model and crop type maps uh, on top of it, you've got a nice target for constraining uh, those types of models. So uh, this is all going to be open. One of the repositories is already open, but we're going to release all the data and code publicly, so it'll be part of this broader effort. So uh, that's all for me for the time being. So thanks, and sorry for not being here today. So I wanted to show some work where I feel there's an edge we can have, you know, as compared to maybe pure machine learning, where we, we are trying to bridge between physics and, and, and machine learning by basically trying to get some influx of the knowledge we have from physics. So, so just give you an example here that's for atmospheric convection. So that's basically deep clouds 
uh, that we are trying to model. And that's been a long standing bias in many of the models, um, climate models. And that's really important for climate sensitivity. And so the typical approach that we people use is they are trying to basically physically represent clouds and how they should actually be represented in the Earth system model or climate model. And so really what it boils down to is you are trying to see what is the impact of those clouds at the scale you, you are trying to resolve. So at the very cost scale of the climate model, so roughly 100 kilometers. So in that case, you would want to know what is the tendency, so the heating, the moistening that's, that's due to clouds, and you want to know that as a function of things you can resolve. So basically the cost scale average value, so let's say temperature, the mean temperature, or the mean humidity that you would actually resolve at the scale of your climate model. Now, the trouble is that this approach has been really uh, uh, fading for, for the last 40 years, and people have been struggling as to define carefully that physical uh, parameterization. So, and when we say they are physical at the end of the day, we understand a lot, you know, but trying to put that in equations and trying to represent those clouds is really, really challenging. So that's basically been one of the reasons why we have so much spread across the different models we have. So what we thought with a couple of colleagues, uh, including Mike Pritchard and Stefan Rasp, is we, we thought maybe what about using a different approach where we could use a data-driven approach as opposed to, uh, as opposed to a, a physically-based approach. And so what we did is we used what we call cloud-reserving models, so simulations at pretty high resolution, so roughly a kilometer or so, where we can actually resolve convection. So we can resolve the deep clouds, we can resolve a lot of the structure, like the example you have here, and we said, what about like constraining those simulations and then trying to learn the, the relationship and learning the impact of convection. So we, we use basically a, a, an opposite approach to what's been done before, where we use a data-driven approach as opposed to a so-called physical approach, even though you can even question whether that's physical or not, because that's relatively empirical. And so at the end of the day, what we had is we had the cost grain value of temperature, the cost grain value of specific humidity, and the heating that you had at the bottom of the, of the grid cell. And for every cost grain pixel, so roughly at the, at the 100 kilometer, we wanted to learn the relationship that we got from the cloud resulting model. So the heating tendency due to convection, so this dt dt, the moistening due to convection, so dq dt, and we wanted to basically learn that. And basically it happens to work quite well. So if you do this type of neural network and you evaluate that compared to the high resolution simulation, in that case that's been cost drained, so that they, it's a fair comparison, you can see at the top that the, the, the high resolution simulation is very, very comparable to the neural network uh, 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 simulation, which we call cloud work. And that's here precipitation field, so that it's in terms of latitude and longitudes, and also in terms of outgoing long wave radiation. Uh, so basically it shows that the simulation is really able to pick up a lot of the structures we are seeing in convection and able to, to pick up a lot of the details of convection. So we're pretty ex excited about that stuff. And another advantage is that it's very, very uh, cheap compared to regular parameterization. So uh, it's 10 times cheaper than even the regular parameterization, but you get a scale that's relatively similar to a high resolution simulation, which is a thousand times more expensive than the regular parameterization. And it goes beyond just the mean, so you could look at you know, some statistics like precipitation distribution, for instance, extremes, and you would see that this is actually working quite well, even for extremes. So we can see that, for instance, we can replicate quite well the, the distribution of precipitation from the high resolution model here using the neural network. And that's very different from the regular so-called physically based parameterization, which is really failing to actually reproduce that and tend to, to, to what we call drizzle too much. So there's very light precipitation and too frequent precipitation. Just to go quickly, you could have some other diagnostics. You could look at waves. Uh, so that's something we are very interested in in the atmosphere. And that's the original high resolution wave spectrum here, as opposed to basically the typical parameterization, which is basically not doing the right job in terms of Kelvin waves and, and, and the MGO, the Madden Juno oscillation. And the neural network is actually able to pick up those things really well. So that's also comforting. It goes beyond just the mean. It means that the spectrum is actually quite, quite well uh, rep reproduced by those. Now, uh, and that's what we've been facing for now uh, more than a year or two years now. It's that there are a couple of issues on the way. So the first one is that we are not really exactly satisfying lots of physical constraints. And 
the main one that you would want to satisfy is basically you want to have energy conservation and mass conservation. So those are strict requirements if you want to do a climate model. And you could look at this plot here, and we are quite close. In fact, it's kind of interesting the you know, network actually kind of learned that relationship, but it's just approximate, you know, and you can be approximate, approximating energy and mass conservation. It's a strict requirement. The other issue is about generalization. So a lot of the machine learning techniques are actually very good at interpolating, but they are really struggling to extrapolate. And the example we use here is actually no, uh, no different from that. And so what we did is we, we did a warming experiment where we basically bumped the temperature of the planet by first one degree, two degree, all the way up to four degrees. And we're trying to see if, if we learned on the historical climate, could we actually predict the future? And what we found is that we are basically completely failing, which is very typical and very similar to what regular parameterization are doing. So they are also failing to actually represent that. So this is showing basically the heating as a function of latitude due to convection. And here we show that we have basically opposite response to what the high resolution simulation would predict. So that's a major no-no, basically. So just a quick summary of, uh, of what we got is that uh, so some of the issues we got from the brute force machine learning is that they do not respect physical laws, so like conservation of energy and mass, and those are strict requirements. So that's really something we would want to actually resolve. And we really have issues with out of sample generalization. So if you look at the top uh, schematic here, so that's a typical uh, machine learning algorithm where you have some input and you're within the range of your prediction. And so you will actually do a very, very good job and likely better than any physical model. Uh, but what we really want is we want to get from input to basically out of sample prediction. So climate change, we, we don't know what is the future climate and we basically want, I mean, the whole goal is actually trying to, to, to predict it. So that's really where there's a question mark here. How can we actually do a better job? And, it's not just for climate change, you could say extremes are the same. So, you know, a lot of the, the algorithms we want to use are to actually look and investigate extremes like a drought or like a heat wave. Those are things that are very important. So how can we get around those things? So that's one thing we've been really trying to investigate uh, in my lab and in Mike Pritchard's lab is uh, trying to see how we could actually influx some of the knowledge we have in, in, in terms of the physics into the machine learning algorithms. And so, the first example here is how can we actually enforce strict energy and mass conservation? And so by strict, we mean like within uh, num uh, uh, numerical errors. And so what we, what Tom Buckler, uh, a postdoc actually with Mike and I is that we can actually find a way to do it directly into the, to, into the machine learning algorithm. So in that case, within a neural network architecture, and we can modify the architecture so that for any response that you will get, it will actually internally satisfy the constraint. And so in that case, we had the energy and mass conservation. We had a, a few more. But the whole idea is actually relatively simple. You have a standard neural network here. And then you add one additional constraining layer, or as many as you need, depending on how many equations you need to exactly satisfy. And so the whole goal is that those constraining layer will basically merge different inputs or intermediate variables and to make sure that they are actually exactly satisfying an equation. Okay, so it's actually very simple. You know an equation, and you put that basically if you want as weights and biases. Uh, and if it's nonlinear, you could actually transform the data so that you make it linear. But at the end of the day, you can actually have as many constraining layers as the equations you want to satisfy. So in our case, we had n degrees of freedom uh, initially in the, 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 the neural networks, and we had two conservation laws, energy and mass. So we really had n minus two degrees of freedom we had to solve in the, in, the, in the algorithm. And so you can check it's actually within basically a numerical errors that we, uh, uh, within the GPU numerical errors that, that we managed to satisfy that. So that's good news. It means we can actually do it uh, on the fly. The, the other thing that we want to do is we want to improve the generalization. So you could say that maybe adding the physical laws actually could help. And that's true to some extent. We had some examples showing that can be true. Uh, but when you have a very high dimensional system, it's very unlikely that adding two more constraints will actually get you anywhere. So what you would want to do is actually try to inflect a little bit more physics into the machine learning algorithm. So again, this is the same example of convection. On the left-hand side is the moistening due to convection. On the right-hand side is the heating. And that's the global average uh, response that we are getting from the high resolution simulation. 
And if you use a brute force machine learning approach in future climates, so that's basically what you will get. You're getting a very, very poor fit to the actual uh, truth data, in that case, the model, the high resolution model. And we have a very difficult time actually predicting out of the sample, the original sample. So we have really this out of sample genization issue. Now one trick you could use, so the first trick would be, let's change the variables we have. So the original variables we had were temperature and specific humidity, and you could say, well, specific humidity is actually not really well bonded, you know, and we know that there's something that's actually bonding uh, specific humidity, and that's basically close to stapron, so the saturation curve of the water vapor pressure. So if instead of using specific humidity, we use relative humidity, we actually get a much better fit. So if you compare to the truth, and we have much less basically generalization issue, and we are getting much closer to the original and, and the expected truth. So that's good news. It means that as you start bringing in physics, you will get closer and closer. And then the second step you could do is you could say, okay, I'm actually dealing with many dimensional quantities like a flux in, in temperature, a flux in moisture, I have a temperature, but those things have units, right? So you could actually try using some sort of non-dimensionalization of the data and trying to actually make them look and more efficiently use the data. So basically you're trying to transform an extrapolation problem back into an interpolation problem by basically changing the units and putting them back into non-dimensional variables. And in that case, that tends to be much working quite well, or at least better, not yet perfect, we're still working on it, or term mostly very clear, but that's still a uh, very, uh, very good, we, we believe. I need to show just quickly one additional example here is that we did the kind of the same five operation and <clears throat> it's basically the same thing that you find is that as you start basically adding physical constraints, we are finding that the generalization actually works better. So that's an example here where when you add physical constraints to an, an existing machine learning algorithm to predict evaporation, you're basically able to better predict uh, extremes. And in that case, a drought and, and here a heat wave. So in that case, we have an increase in the R square. So basically the, the, our capacity to predict a drought or extremes, which is always increasing when we're using this so-called hybrid approach where you're basically adding physical constraints to the machine learning algorithm. And that's true for a drought, that's also true for heat rate. And so we really believe that this is one way to go where basically everyone is happy. You're still bringing in your physical knowledge, but at the same time, you're really trying to harvest the data you have. So that seems to, to work quite well, especially for organization. So quick conclusion. So um, machine learning seems to be an appealing technique to look at uh, separate processes or like uh, climate processes. So in that case, for instance, deep clouds or convection. But there are some major issues on the way, like con con conservation laws like, and physical invariance that we want to clearly satisfy. And we also want to do a better job in terms of generalization. So, and it seems that some sort of hybrid approach bringing physics and machine learning might be the way to go and to tackle that. So thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Since we don't have Pierre here, if you have any quick question, we can ask him now. Yes. Uh, Pierre, we have a question about how you do the physical constraint in the model. Are you putting a constraint on the range of the variables, or uh, is it more of a like physics embedding into the model? It's physics embedding, yeah. We are not trying to put any range on the variables. So basically, the, I, I'm trying to think of that like, imagine like if you're doing turbulence, you're always looking at the Reynolds number, right? And that's a way to basically collapse different types of information into one, into basically similar types of, of lab studies, right? Or, or atmospheric studies. And that's basically what we are trying to do. Like as you start trying to do dimensionless uh, 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 numbers and use, you're trying to transform like, what seems to be an extrapolation problem in terms of the distributions into back into an interpolation problem. And that's really what you're trying to do when you're trying to bring in physics. Yeah. The other thing that it does is that your, your physical constraints actually give you a, a nice prior, if you will. So if you have a Bayesian perspective, you could say it's kind of giving you a prior to what, what, you, would, what you would expect. Or at least that's how I'm seeing it. Thank you. Any other questions? No? 
Okay. Thank you, Pierre. Thanks so much, yeah. And sorry for not being able to. No, thank you. Thanks.